Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 197. Today, I'm settling into the holiday season, bringing you some warm thoughts, reflective conversation, and inspiring ideas. Uh, But first up, I'd love to tell you what I've been working on lately. Now, you know, I travel a lot, right? Uh, Nearly every weekend. So I have about two weeks between uh, the last one, and then we're heading out to Orlando to wrap up 2016. And so I have been digging into my own family history. Isn't that nice? (laughs) I mean, to be able to research my own family. And one of the things that's always bugged me, and, and this seems silly, but I haven't been able to locate the exact date of my great grandparents' marriage. Seems like it should be a very simple thing, right? But they married just a couple of years prior to the Great Earthquake of 1906, which means The courthouse was destroyed and thereby all the records that were at the courthouse in San Francisco. So I've never come across it and I've kept my eyes out, but hadn't put a lot of devoted effort into it lately, but that's always been in the back of my mind. So I have been remodeling my laundry room. It was burnt orange. That was the color of the laundry room when we moved in this house in Texas. And it had to go. So I painted it white. So this ended up leading me to this marriage record because I bought a frame at the container store. uh, And it's got two strings with little tiny wooden clothespins so that you could attach old photos, documents, that kind of thing. So I thought I must have pictures in my scrapbooks from my family of the ladies in my family doing their laundry on their clotheslines, right? Well, I have in my guest bedroom, um, a, one big cabinet full of the really old books from the turn of the century. And I thought, well, you know, I'll go through the so I just got lost in it. And I spent hours just uh, the other night kind of pulling them out one by one, getting out my magnifying glass and looking through these photos. So as I'm going through all the photos, not a nary one photo of anybody doing laundry or anybody outside in the laundry. I mean, my grandmothers always had their heels and their gloves on and their hats and lots of special events and comings and goings kinds of photographs, not a lot of daily stuff. But sure enough, one of the events that I found in probably the 10th scrapbook was a photo of my great grandparents. And under this photo dated November 19th, 1947, it says that they're all getting together and celebrating the Burkett's 45th wedding anniversary. So there I've got it. November 19th or really close thereabouts. They may have gotten together a day or two before or after the actual date, right? 1902 would be the approximate date of marriage for my great grandparents in San Francisco. So the next step is if I can't get to the courthouse, I'm thinking newspapers, right? And I use actually the Burkett's as examples in my book, how to find your family history in newspapers. When I originally did the searches for them, though, I was doing it at the California Digital Archive. um, And I found all kinds of newspaper articles. And in fact, that was when I really became obsessed with using Evernote, because it dawned on me as I was downloading all of these things I was finding, that Evernote could apply OCR and make those images of those newspaper articles keyword searchable, which of course, we all love, right? And I've talked about that here on the show. Now that I've got a date, uh, I took a step back and I thought, you know, I'm going to go to Library of Congress, Chronicling America, and just see what they have. Now they also have the San Francisco call. That was the newspaper that I had researched back um, several years ago when I was originally researching. And as I went through, sure enough, I got into November 1902. And I found it on the 20th. It wasn't announcement of their marriage, but it was just a listing of folks who had gone in and gotten marriage licenses. And it says Charles A. Burkett, 25, gives his address, and Ellen Lynch, 24, um, had both applied for a marriage license. And it was reported 
on November 20th of 1902. It's a perfect example of why we need to go and search for items in the same collection when it's held at different websites. The various websites may all apply OCR, that optical character recognition. And and so that means they could all be keyword searchable. And you can feel like, well, I've keyword searched this over in, uh, let's say, the California newspaper archives. Great. Well, I didn't find it in the San Francisco call. So I guess it's not out there. But the same collection is also OCR'd over at the Library of Congress, Chronicling America website. And for whatever reason, their OCR had a better hit on the name Burkett, and it was able to unearth uh, several different articles. So it was a great reminder to me because I know this, and I don't know why it didn't occur to me. You know how it is. You follow those bright, shiny objects, you get down rabbit holes, and then it gets frustrating because you're not finding something. And sometimes we forget to take a step back, you know, and see what our options are. Does the same collection exist somewhere else? And there are many duplications of collections because a lot of these different websites are partnering together. So this was a great example of it. I was able to grab that marriage license. I am still looking for an actual marriage announcement. I'm not so sure I'm going to find that in the San Francisco papers simply because they didn't actually run a lot of them. They have a society page, but you know, it's a big city. And so they weren't necessarily running unique articles about each and every engagement and wedding. But they did pull records and pull information out of the courthouse and get those listings printed up. And that's how I found it. So it was just kind of nice to be able to put this to rest finally and know uh, when that date was. And the other lesson in this story would be that it's worth going back and reviewing those documents and those photo albums that you have looked at before. Because I have looked through those scrapbooks so many times. And I just wasn't focused. I wasn't thinking about that at that time. And you know, sometimes we look at things and we think, oh, well, I've already got all that. But actually, I didn't have that marriage record. And so getting that date out of that scrapbook, boy, it just jumped out at me this time around. Take a second look, you know, grab a cup of tea, and give yourself an hour and go back through some of those old family scrapbooks. Not only did I find the marriage of Charles and Ellen, but I also found the original Carte de Vista photograph um, that I have of my grandmother, Burkett. Uh, Her last name was Sparowski when she was a, a child, obviously, and that was her maiden name. And I've got this large oval portrait of her as just a little toddler holding an apple that sits behind me at my desk. You may have seen that in one of my online videos. Well, I found the original card and it was in, again, one of these um, scrapbooks. Haven't looked at it in a long time, but as you may know from listening to the show, I recently got a chance to visit Gillespie, Illinois, where Alfreda Sporowski was born in 1913. When I turned this over, it says in pencil, I think this is the photographer writing this, Mrs. August Sporowski. And oh my gosh, Sporowski is really just barely readable. It's kind of faded and it's been rubbed off a little bit. The next line, I think, is like an address. I think it's SW for Southwest. It looks like Post would be maybe the street name. And Then there is another word that I cannot read. So I may need to put this on the show notes because I need you guys to look at this and let me know. I helped somebody the other day identify a a cause of death on a death certificate because she said, I can't read this. And I looked at it and and I was able to spot that it did say malaria. So um, this is post, I don't know if it says farm or what, I don't know what this says. But then it says Gillespie, Illinois, capital R-O-F-F. 198. That may very well be an internal code that he used for his photos. I don't know. Pretty cool to find new things in old places, isn't it? It's always worth an extra look and have a little checklist, maybe of some of the things that you're trying to discover. You might find they are right under your nose. There's new records online. Now, every Friday, the Genealogy Gems blog reports new record collections that we've spotted online. We put that on our website at genealogygems.com. And I can tell we're not the only ones excited about these because of how many of you are reading them and sharing them on social media. 
If you haven't noticed these Friday new records reports, uh, watch for them on the Genealogy Gems Facebook page at facebook.com slash genealogy gems. Come on over there and like us and we always post them up there. And of course, you'll also see the record updates in our uh, weekly newsletter that comes out on Thursdays. And you can sign up for that for free as well at our website. So anyway, recently, I've noticed a lot of new marriage records coming online. Marriage records are key to building your family tree. Not only do they tell you who an ancestor married, but sometimes they really reveal more clues about the bride and groom's past, such as their parents' names or their birthplace, or at least their residence at the time of the marriage. I know how excited I was just to find a listing of the marriage license that was a hard-to-find item for my Burkett family. So a marriage record helps you identify the couple with more confidence in later records as well, because you'll know both partners' names that should appear in their children's birth records. Any deeds or probate records that name both husband and wife and uh, things like that. And marriage records, especially once you go further back, are often more likely to exist in many places than even birth or death records. And that's because marriage was a legal contract that had implications for property ownership and inheritance. So weddings have always been some of the most carefully recorded uh, records out there. The new marriage records I've seen recently online include a new index to more than 3 million marriage licenses for recent New York City marriages. That's 1950 to 1995. We're talking real recent. It's from the Reclaim the Records organization, and you can search it at a fantastic website that tells you what New York City marriage records exist and where to look for them. And that website is nycmarriageindex.com. And we'll have a link for you in the show notes for this episode. It's number 197. And we'll have that, of course, along with all the links that you're going to hear about in today's show. Family Search recently put new marriage records online for Arkansas, Nebraska, Ohio, Tennessee, Washington, and California. And they keep adding records as they become available, both images of the records and the indexed records. Some of these collections are getting really quite large. Ohio's got over 1.5 million. California's topped 2.4 million. And Tennessee, a whopping 3.3 million plus. There are marriage records in new or updated civil registration databases for New Zealand, Belgium, Nicaragua, Russia, Argentina, and Sweden as well. And remember, it's always free to search at familysearch.org. So check those out. In these collections, you may find different kinds of documentation as well. License applications, actual licenses, certificates and registers, each means something a little different. And they make it look a little bit different as well. Since we're celebrating the Victorian age, this last quarter of 2016, I I put a picture of a Victorian era marriage certificate into the show notes. Its design is elaborate, and it's very complicated and colorful and sentimental and really typical of what I think of as kind of Victorian style. I think you'll enjoy taking a look at that. So to learn more about marriage records, I really recommend I've got a free podcast episode that I devoted to marriage records. It's episode number 24, and that's in my step-by-step podcast. It's free. It's called Family History genealogy made easy. And uh, you'll find that there's a link in the show notes. You can also go to our website, genealogygems.com, hover your mouse over podcast and click on family history, genealogy made easy. From my old hometown One with some jokes From my old pal Jim Brown Bring me a letter From that girl of mine Saying that she's longing for me All the time Bring me a letter From my proud old dad 
that we are winning, and I bet he's glad, but more than any other, a line from my old mother. Bring me a letter from my hometown. Recently, I heard from Jo, who says that she has been following genealogy gems for about a year, and she sent in a brick wall research question about a female ancestor. Now, many of us appreciate that women can be notoriously difficult to find in old records. So here we go. She says, I've been fortunate to find information about most of my great grandparents. I've hit a wall with my maternal great grandmother who immigrated from Switzerland to the U.S. in the 1880s when she was eight years old. I was hoping that by upgrading to international records on ancestry that I could find the ship and where she and her mother came from. The curious thing for me is that she and her mother traveled solo to the U.S. and went to Cincinnati, Ohio. I've been to Cincinnati and I have searched there and found directories with addresses, but no profession is listed like other people. I didn't find any ship records either. Where might you suggest that I look or search to find more information? And she says, thank you again. I've used many of your hints to find out things about my families. Well, then I will give Joe some more hints. Joe says that she hasn't found any passenger arrival list. So I'm really curious as to how she knows that her ancestor and her mother arrived alone. Perhaps some handed down family stories? Not sure about that. My hints for Joe follow the immigrant cycle naturally from arrival to naturalization, with an emphasis on life in between those events, because those in between records may really help you find the former and the latter. Joe could dig a little deeper for a passenger list arrival record. Railroads linked Cincinnati with major ports by the 1880s, and you can't entirely rule out immigrants coming up the Mississippi River to the Ohio to Cincinnati. So her family could have arrived at any U.S. port. According to an Ancestry.com article, more than 80% of immigrants arrived in the port of New York by the 1890s. So Joe might scrutinize those New York passenger arrival lists for the 1880s again. And there's a free database at castlegarden.org and at familysearch.org. And subscribers can search databases at Ancestry.com or, of course, by mypast.com as well. Here's a tip for deep searching. If the mother and daughter may have been listed under a spelling or a surname that you can't really guess at, and you're using a search box at a site such as Ancestry that is pretty flexible, do what they call a nameless search for all girls around age eight for arrivals in particular years. And then start adding the names back in gradually, adding the first initial of the first name to narrow things down, then maybe the full first name, then maybe the first initial, the last name, and so forth. Try putting Switzerland in the place of origin field in the search box. But remember that even if they were Swiss, they may not have been coming directly from Switzerland. Also, you could try typing Swiss in the keywords field, just the word Swiss which is going to bring up that word in the ethnicity or the nationality column. That column doesn't have its own search field in Ancestry.com, but it is indexed. So you can use that keyword field to search for it. So try that, putting the ethnicity in there. Sifting through passenger lists still may not help, especially if it's a common name and there are just too many possibilities. Joe may do better to switch tactics and look at Swiss immigration to Cincinnati during that time period. Who was coming, why they were coming, and where they were coming from. This is called researching the social history or historical context of a family, which I've blogged about before, and I'll link to some of those tips in the show notes for this episode, so you can check those out. A Google search for the words Switzerland Immigration Cincinnati brings up a free ebook that you can read at the Internet Archive. It's called The Swiss in the United States. 
It's published by the Swiss American Historical Society. The book does mention Swiss settlers in Cincinnati, but not with a whole lot of detail. But there's another lead here, the Swiss American Historical Society. Google that organization. Their site says they don't help with genealogical research. However, they may be a resource for finding materials generally on Swiss settlers in Cincinnati. It's worth emailing them to ask. Their website points genealogists to the Swiss Center website. The link they give isn't exactly right, but it does take you to the right website where you can click on Swiss Center Genealogy to learn more about it. Read some introductory information, browse the website, and again, contact the library to ask what they may know about the Swiss in Cincinnati. And while I'm gearing this to um, Joe's question, I I hope that you're kind of getting some ideas here, thinking about this process I'm talking about, because this could play into a number of areas within your own research. In the U.S., a strong resource for that kind of in between time between an immigrant's arrival and naturalization is often the records of ethnic organizations. These might be referred to as fraternal societies, or aid or colonization or cultural societies. Local chapters existed where nationality or language group had a really strong presence. So what about Swiss societies that were active in Cincinnati? Might be. You could Google Cincinnati Genealogy Swiss Society, and you will find a link, first of all, to the Hamilton County, Ohio Genealogical Society, and I've heard that one is fantastic, but also to a page on the FamilySearch Wiki. There's a link to Germans in Hamilton County, Ohio. It says Germans in the title, but the Google summary mentions Swiss Colonization Society records. Ooh, you got to click on that one. Now, unfortunately, the article doesn't add much detail, but a follow-up Google search for Swiss Colonization Society records brings up a published translation for its records from the late 1850s, which is encouraging, but not quite the right time frame for Jo. She'd want to keep looking for those. A related search for Swiss Club Cincinnati brings up the Swiss Benevolent Association of Cincinnati, Ohio. Now, it doesn't have a history page on its website, so I googled the name of the group separately. A finding aid comes up for the original manuscript records at the University of Cincinnati. The collection says that it dates from the club's founding in 1871, but when you look closer, the only record that old mentioned in the finding aid description is their constitution. Some records are too old. Some are too new, and neither organization is guaranteed to have been associated with Joe's family, of course. But now Joe has some leads. I'd ask about those society records or any other Swiss records at the current Swiss Benevolent Society at the Cincinnati Library's Local History and Genealogy Department, and of course, at that Hamilton County Genealogical Society. The last step for that immigrant was naturalization records, and certainly Joe should look for those for her ancestor as well. Naturalization records from that time period won't reliably tell you where an ancestor was from, but they're still worth looking at, especially if census or other records indicate that the person naturalized. The thing to remember when looking for women's and children's naturalization records is that during this time period, they automatically became naturalized if their parents or fathers did. So individual records for married women and minor children won't exist under their own names. But a woman could have applied on her own, too. So check the show notes for more details on researching women's naturalizations. And you can learn more in a free three-episode series on immigration and naturalization records in my Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast. From my 
I'm a firm believer in taking responsibility for the life and future of my genealogy data. So instead of just uploading my information only onto someone else's genealogy website, I enter it into my master database on my computer into the premier genealogy software program. It's Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. Genealogy software is Roots Magic's primary focus. It's not just a sideline. I continue to be really impressed by their free online training videos and all the rich features they add. Not only can you import a GEDCOM file from another program, but now you can directly import any Family Tree Maker file with everything attached. That's everything attached. In fact, Roots Magic can import a bigger variety of older Family Tree Maker files than any single version of Family Tree Maker itself. It's just one more way that Roots Magic has been reaching out to the genealogy community and helping them care for their most precious data, their family tree. And there's even more to look forward to because Roots Magic has announced an agreement with Ancestry and later they're going to be able to synchronize your family tree with Ancestry. There's never been a better time to try or switch to Roots Magic. Head to rootsmagic.com and download the free Roots Magic Essentials today. You're going to love it. That's rootsmagic.com. I'm more aware than ever that if anything ever happened to my genealogy files, I would be devastated. And boy, have my files expanded since I started this research at the ripe old age of eight years old. As genealogists, we don't just have paper files anymore. But we also have digital files like our genealogy database and precious old photos that we've spent hours scanning. No matter where we upload our family tree or anything else relating to our family history on the web, the responsibility for the total safety and security of our files lies with us. That's why I'm so proud to announce that Backblaze is now the official backup of Lisa Louise Cook and Genealogy Gems. For the past few years, I've been researching and I've been test driving backup services and hands down, Backblaze is my choice. It's certainly the easiest service to use and I love their free app that allows me to access all my files on my smartphone and my tablet. Plus, it backs up everything, including my video files. Yikes, I didn't realize before looking at Backblaze that other services skip over backing up videos. So don't wait another day to ensure that all your files are safe and secure. Back them up like I do with Backblaze. Head to backblaze.com slash Lisa and scroll down. You'll see my smiling face there and a great offer. Just 50 bucks for a year's peace of mind and the best cloud backup around. Go to backblaze.com slash Lisa. Well, I've been looking forward to this conversation because today I'm welcoming our very own Genealogy Gems editor, Sunny Morton, to the show. She's going to talk about the value of writing your own family history stories. Welcome back to the show, Sunny. Thank you. Thanks for having me and to talk about a topic I love. Oh, absolutely. And I, I love having you on the show. The book is terrific. And I know back in 2011, you published the first edition of your life story writing guide. Now it was a hardback keepsake kind of edition. And now with this second edition that's been released, it's been retitled, and it's called Story of My Life, a workbook for preserving your legacy. Congratulations. This thing is beautiful. And I just love the look and feel of it. Thank you. I do too. I'm really excited that they've taken this guide and um, turned it into a, a really easy to use format. You know, we write these books. And I think often we have a very specific audience in mind when we write books, and they're just for particular audiences. But I mean, story of my life, this book is for everyone. Everyone has a life. Everyone <laughs> has stories. <laughs> I think that a lot of family history lovers will be the first ones to tell you, you know, how much each person's life stories matter. 
And that's really what this book is all about, is capturing those life stories. Um, I think a lot of us in the genealogy community will say that, but then we don't necessarily follow through ourselves on writing down our own memories, at least not, you know, not all of them, not thoroughly for our whole lives. And this, the story of my life book really helps you do that in a piece by piece kind of fashion that makes the job a lot more reasonable and a lot more appealing, I think. I think it asks some really fun questions and gets you thinking. So, but I don't know, do you find that? Do you think that it's harder to write our own memories than it is to go chase our ancestors? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I really get it that my stories are important. Uh, I was just uh, just had the grandsons over for the weekend, this last weekend, and I started telling some stories. And Davey's getting to be he's seven years old now, and seven and a half. And he's really getting it and asking questions. He's starting to get the concept that I'm his mom's mom. And that the picture we were looking at was my grandma and how that lines up. And you know, that was new to him. And so I thought, gosh, it's, it really is important. I need to start writing down some of my own stories. I, I so much wish every day we sit down and do our genealogy research, we think, oh, I wish she'd written this down. Oh, I wish she'd told me more about this, you know, whoever it is that you're researching. And, you know, I love my three daughters and, of course, the two grandsons, and I, and I want to have them have my stories and, and some of the lessons I've learned from my life. And, of course, some of the things I just want to tell them now, and they're on, and it's on my mind, you know, and it, this is the time to capture it. And I know sometimes even now with grown kids, they aren't always interested, right? And yet, not kind of, yet, not, not yet. yet. They're not and some ready to they are. Yet. Yeah, right. My youngest, Hannah is, gosh, coming up on 25. And she's been asking questions and showing interest in things that I'm like, wow, where'd this come from? Because three years ago, I could not have paid you to sit and listen to me talk about this. So sometimes I I admit it that if I have a half an hour to sit down and work on, you know, family stories, I think that's what I should be doing. Of course, I just get drawn to it be so much more intriguing and interesting to just take that half an hour and go research somebody else's life, right? Rather than dusting off my own memories and recording them for my descendants. And I suppose that is pretty common, isn't it? I think so. I I don't think that we are the only ones who feel that way. In fact, I think of life story writing for many people. I think it's kind of like I feel about a trip to the gym. (laughs) I I don't want to go. Um, I put it off. I make excuses not to go. But then once I'm there, I really enjoy myself. I enjoy my workouts. And it's really good for me. Like there's a lasting value to investing a little bit of time in me and in you know true. my stories right mm-hmm. there's there is there is value in investing times in ourselves isn't it it's so much like writing the narrative of a research project that you've been working on and what just having to put it in story form reveals to you and i find that myself as i was you know kind of looking through the book and the the questions and the prompts are are fascinating and and they do kind of they do bring you in so the the good news is once you crack open the book and you start doing it and you actually make it a priority it's really fun and there's so many interesting things in here and as i was answering some i was learning about myself as well which is a really nice byproduct You know, it is. And when you say you're learning about yourself, um, I think it's easy to say, what do you mean learning about yourself? Because aren't you just remembering? No, I don't think so. And I think that to me, the primary value of remembering our stories is not just the stories themselves, but it's the value we find what we think and feel about it when we look back later. Like what's it's the so what factor. Why does this story matter to you? How has it changed you or shaped you? Or what value do you feel like it could have to to share it with somebody else? Do, can you give them hope or teach them something because of your experience? So I, I think that you're right. Our stories, when we look back on them, can teach us something. Absolutely. And, and it's really that so what factor that I find myself yearning for as I discover things about my ancestors, I think, okay, I've got the nuts and bolts of it. I know what happened. But I wish I could hear from them. Why? Why did you make that decision? What was what was driving you at this point? You know, what drew you to your spouse? I mean, and what difference did it make for you down the road? I mean, those are the things we all really yearn to learn. I agree. I agree. And so I wonder if 
I think the best way to show this is to actually put you on the spot. Is uh oh. <laughs> you said that you started asking yourself some of these questions. Can I ask you some questions here? What if we pull a little role reversal? It's my turn. All right. Well, good. Um, I think that this can be an exercise that shows just how meaningful it can be to go back and pull those memories out of the trunk and see how you feel afterward about them. Okay. I asked you ahead of time. You sent me a picture of some objects that hold some special memories or meaning for you. Okay. So I'm looking at this picture. I see three beautiful dresses. I see a light blue and a pink and a white. I see a a tea set. I see a black floral tray. So pick something and describe it for us. Tell us what, it, what it's all about. Well, it's interesting because when I took that picture, and I, I just wanted to share with people on Instagram and, and on, the, on the blog post about the fact that I was loving this book, and I had my husband snap this picture. But of course, I positioned myself in front of this little vignette like you're talking about. Uh, I've been redecorating my master bedroom and and I've been taking it as an opportunity to absolutely surround myself with the things I love the most. And surprise, surprise, they're all family history things. <laughs> and, yeah, no surprise. <laughs> and, and when I was looking at the picture, because you said to me, oh, you know, send me a picture. And I did. And I realized, wow, you're right. Almost everything in that photo almost exclusively comes from my mom's side of the family. Um, the dresses have vivid memories for me. The probably the most precious items are actually on the bureau. Here's the funny thing that the bureau that I'm standing in front of is my grandfather's, which my husband almost sold at a garage sale. And I went running down the (laughs) because he's like, how much for this? And I'm like, no, 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 no. And I'm pulling it back in the garage. I don't care that it's this blue color you don't like. I'm hanging on to it. And I'm so glad I did because it fits perfectly into my new decorating design. It does. Um, it does. I thought you had painted it to oh go no, with that little vignette. Oh, no. My grandmother yeah. did that. And and here I've been doing all this chalk painting and shabby chic stuff. And this was something my grandmother did 50 years ago was she would paint things and then she'd pretend antique it, you know, with the, the antiquing cream that they would put on it. But the the dresses I have hung on to and carted around since I first obtained them, oh, my gosh, I... I probably was newly married, and my mom was cleaning out some of her closets and things. And I said, "No, no, no, no! I want these. These are, you know, beautiful princess-looking dresses." And I thought, "I have daughters, so maybe, you know, they'll want to play dress up or whatever." And I've hung on to them. I've thought a million times about letting them go, and now I wouldn't part with them for the world. They're from the '40s and the '50s, and they're prom dresses, and they were my mom's and her sisters, and. The reason I think I have such fond memories of them is because I can remember being maybe five years old, and I was the one towhead blonde in my generation. My aunt was the one towhead blonde in her generation. <laughs> and it's so funny. There's one single blonde female in each generation. Everybody else is brunette. And I always identified with my aunt in that way. And she was the youngest and she had these amazing prom dresses and she had one of those plastic heads on her little dresser. Oh yes. And it had one of those it was like a wig, but it wasn't a wig. It was it was to give yourself a bouffant on the top of like a a, a bun kind of. Do you know what I mean? Um so in the early sixties they would poof up their hair and she didn't have as much hair, so she'd have this kind of this hair piece, I guess is what you'd call it. And I would walk into her room and when I was five and I would visit my grandma and she still lived there. And she was quite a bit younger than my mom. And I'd see her beautiful party dresses and her beautiful pretend hair, you know, and all these things. And I was like, oh, she's like a foo-foo girl. You know, she just looked like a princess to me. And it's funny that I inherited three of them because I have the three daughters. And they remind me of them. And they remind me of the women in my family and and kind of that that feminine side of us all. The The tea set is actually a chocolate set. Uh, that's what I was told. Um, I got those from my mom who got them from her grandma. I remember them in my grandmother's house, but they actually belonged to her mother. She brought them over from Prussia. They immigrated in 1910. And I think that was the one thing that she brought over along with a scrapbook that her family had put together for her. And they're chipped, and they're totally imperfect. But I think about how kind of weather beaten they are, and yet how feminine 
and that that it was important to her to have I, I, I envision it being kind of her stability, kind of like, you know, I might be mucking across the country and, and, and at the bottom of this ship and everything. But when we get there, we're going to have our hot chocolate and sit together and be a family and, and have something nice in our home. And so it's made a long journey to end up on the Bureau in, in Texas. That's really neat. There's a a black, is it a painted tray next to it with florals it's on a it? a framed picture. Oh, it's a framed picture. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what it's what's fun about that is that it is the one contribution from me. So everything there from the, the gold jewelry box that belonged to my grandmother, the chocolate set, her mother, um, there's a picture of me and my grandmother on the wall, and then all the dresses of all the generations of the, the gals. And But that picture, I saw it at an antique store a couple of months ago, and it has peonies, which is like my favorite flower. It has all the colors of all of these things. And I saw it, and it was one of those things that just jumped out at me and said, you have to take me home. And I put it on this, and it just tied the whole thing together. You know what I mean? So it was like my little touch with my favorite flower to kind of pull all these objects together, which all have something in common. And um, so I don't know, I'm always happy. It's one of those things I can look at it and I'm happy. I like the way it makes me feel. <laughs> so this this little vignette, so I'm, I'm listening to what you say and the words that I hear you. I hear over and over, these, these belong to the women in your family. And it reminds you of this, this, this feminine heritage, this female heritage. And, you know, we have these delicate things here. The, the dresses, they're just these stunning pastels, but just soft. Um, and then you have this tea set that's really fragile. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet it survived a trip across the world. Yeah. And and then you have the one thing that's unabashedly yours that ties them all together. And, you know, honestly, Lisa, you are the thing that ties them all together now. Oh, my gosh, that's so true. That is, that's so true. I'm I'm aware at how hard my grandmother and my great grandmother worked to keep some femininity into their lives. I know that for sure that my grandmother sacrificed um, as far as she may not have had the prettiest dress or the newest purse or anything, but she made sure that when her daughter was going to leave the house and go to the prom, that, you know, everything she'd save, she worked nights as a maternity nurse. So she worked all night long. She went 12-hour stretches, and she didn't have to work. Her husband was a train conductor, but she did. And I know she sacrificed and worked very hard just so that they could just have a little bit better life than her and could enjoy some of the finer things. I know she would have loved to enjoy. When I read back in her journals, I know that she didn't always get to. And um, so... I guess I like being the tie, maybe just the idea that I get to pass that on. I don't want my daughters to to miss that because life is pretty good here in the U.S. You know, we have our ups and downs, but um, a lot of people worked very hard to get us here. And, and I hope they can appreciate that. So I wonder how all of this, you describing something that's this sort of strong sense of, of being a female and something that is such a strong sense that the women work extra hard in order to express that in their own lives and to, to have that available to their daughters as well. And you mentioned working a little extra harder so that they get the girls get their prom dresses. But you also earlier mentioned this dresser, right, of painting mm-hmm. it blue or then, then antiquing it and giving it the fake. And, you know, we, we these trends come back and repeat themselves. And now we're doing <laughs> so the same true. thing, right? But I wonder how you feel like that legacy has manifested itself in your life. It's interesting. My husband had a great career. Um, he's just recently retired. And and here I am working feverishly all the time and bringing my own daughters into my own business, which is kind of neat. I I have a very, very strong work ethic. And I know that that came from a lot of these gals. And yet, um, I want my daughters to know that for them, the choices are going to be all their own. You know, they get to choose their path and their passions. I'm so lucky to get to, to work at my passion, which is family history. I just want to be able to pass that on to them and things that I pass on, you know, not everything resonates with everybody, but I think right. that it would be easier for them to understand each object when I, if I, as I take the time and I've been writing about them in the book, something that may not have grabbed them, 
they could read it and then go, Oh, wow, I didn't, didn't realize this thing, you know, this isn't just a chocolate set. This is something she took across the ocean, hauling a four year old with her by the arm, you know, and trying to hang on to her, her few belongings. And this was one of them was this China. And while I know that they all enjoy, you know, like my oldest really enjoys the modern decorating and that kind of thing. I, I do know that all of us go through transitions and changes in our feelings about things. And I feel like by recording them, I'm giving them the full story. I'm not just passing on objects and saying, here, pick what you want and, you know, toss the rest. I, I, I want them to, to know the stories behind them. So even if they don't want to necessarily embrace everything into their own home, they'll know who's the ideal person to pass this on to, you know, right. I I talk about this sometimes in in one of my classes about um, getting the next generation involved. And I I do think that one of the ways we protect our genealogy research, our heirlooms, everything else is to recognize not everything resonates in a really personal way with everybody. So we don't need every generation to have this high end genealogist, but there's these transfer people. I like to call them mm-hmm. transfer people. They're people who we entrust, take this, understand it, care for it, and get it to the next right person, the person who will treasure it and be able to take it, you know, maybe the next step or incorporate it in their life in some special way. That's what I want my daughters to know, too, is, yeah, I hoard everything. <laughs> I keep everything and I love it. And I, and I surround myself. My, my one daughter said, Oh, my word, mom, this is looking like a museum in here. But you know, that's okay. It's my happy place. And um, I feel like as I'm recording these stories about the things and the and the uh, memories I have of these items and these objects that, that will give them more context. So they'll know kind of how they want to, to use them or keep them or pass them on in the future. So I am sensing that it's very difficult to tell the story of our own lives without telling the stories of those who came before, or at least for us, maybe because we're yeah. so tied to the past. And as I, I'm listening to you, and you are talking about yourself, but I, I remember reading one time a historian who looked at how women wrote their own personal stories. And they said that women identify themselves in terms not so much as the the personal, but in terms of their relationships with each other mm. and with with family. And so it's very difficult to have a woman see herself existing in a vacuum because they recognize uh, the importance of each person's relationship to how that contributes one more dimension to their lives. You know, who they are. Well, I'm this person to this person and I'm this person to this other yes. person. Right? And that's that's something that I talk a lot about in Story of My Life because our memories really do include other people's stories. And so there's a lot of sensitivities that come into those that's come up on the podcast Mm -hmm. now and then of what stories do we tell? What stories do we not tell? And some of these stories that overlap with other people, some don't belong to us, but some do. Part of the guiding text that's in Story of My Life talks about how you tease out which stories to go ahead and tell that you're telling here. I love it. You're telling an immigration story through a tea set. What a great way to tell a story. And and that we've had to protect it, you know, that it actually takes effort to hang on to things, to record the stories. That's part of how we protect our family history, our legacy. And I protect is the one word that's coming to mind. I feel a very strong sense of that. You know, that if I don't do my part in this chain, that it could get lost. And I don't think any of us want to feel like that. I agree. And I think a lot of us would identify with what you're talking about it being the sort of the, the transfer person. The image that comes to my mind is if the past is, is a river that flows through us, I think that for some of us, it kind of flows over the top of us and we the feel of it. And for others, we sort of collect it and it becomes sort of a still pool and where we capture some of it and it sits with us mm-hmm. and mixes pretty indelibly with who we are. And then you pass it forward and your legacy is built into it as well. And you know, it's interesting. Um, I have researched my husband's family a lot. In fact, I was doing that the last couple of days again and found some really cool things. And my daughter said to me the other day, you know, I don't know that dad's ever talked to me 
about, I don't, I can't even visualize him as a kid except for the picture you put on the wall because I, he never talks about any of that, you know, or like his dad. And, and Bill's father passed away, right, you know, a couple of years before we met. He's walking around with this treasure trove of knowledge that really nobody else has quite like him. And, uh, my thought was not only did I get a copy from me, but having a copy for my husband. And, you know, he keeps saying, what should I do for the kids for Christmas? What are we going to do? I'm like, just give them your story. I hope I can get him to do it. In fact, we got a letter. Um, it was from a gal named Susan. And I have to read this to you. She says, okay, she had one idea about how she was using the book with a loved one. She says, my husband and I took a slightly different approach by having him write his memories out. And then together we wrote a finished edition. So <laughs> if you don't feel like you can handle it all, you can get a partner, right? Somebody you can help. Absolutely. You. And she says, this is where Sonny's book would be so helpful. Working together brought back memories. And I learned some new stuff, too. We laughed our heads off, cried some, too. And after 42 years of marriage, it was one of the most fun things we've ever done together. She says, Sonny's Guide will be a wonderful help, whether doing your own stories or your spouse's best to you and your readers. And I thought, so true. I may have to help him along with it and kind of and book some of that me time for him. But what a treasure that will be. I will really enjoy getting some of the background on all these people that I've done all this research on. But even more importantly, uh, he's just going to have an absolute treasure to hand off to his daughters. I know they're yearning for it. So I've done a lot of that gathering my husband's history, too, because he never really talked about it. And I remember early conversations with him trying to get him to talk about it and trying question after question after question until I landed on something that he was interested in talking about. I love him so much. I'm I'm jealous of the 21 years I didn't get to know him, that he lived without me. And I recapture some of that by asking him these questions about the past. And I do it. A lot of these questions that are in the book are really great conversation starters. They're great follow-up questions. And this is whether they're going to write it down or not. My husband will never ever write his own story, Uh but I can ask him questions. And I have written, we've done this on car trips. I'll ask him questions and I will write the answers down because I care. I've um, advised people, you know, use this book in an oral history interview. Just open it up to a page. I did this at a a lecture a couple months ago where we just just opened up the book and had the people who were there just start asking each other questions. And it was very fun to see the kinds of questions they'd ask each other and what they were willing to say, because I think that they were willing to say some things that maybe their own children would, I can't believe you said that. (laughs) You never told me that, right? Um, So I think that that a, a book like this and questions like this will evoke memories and rethink the past from a different perspective than we have in the past. And offer us an opportunity to connect in a whole new way. Because like what you're describing, I was thinking, uh, I'm going to pull some of these out, some of these questions specifically over Christmas and Thanksgiving. And I'd love to go around the table and have each person answer the same question. There's all kinds of ways to capture stuff using technology. Uh, Even if it's just sitting around the table, we could open up our smartphone and record. Um, We could sit and write, but sometimes it's flowing and you don't want to slow that down. So just having the tablet or the phone or whatever sitting there quietly on the table and recording, you can go back later and either transcribe or or have it do some of the transcription for you. So many opportunities. I I think what this all means is, is there's no more barriers. We just need to do this. I hope that what this conversation communicates is the rich value of going back and looking again at our own selves. This is wonderful. Again, the book we've been talking about, and I've been talking with the author of this wonderful book, it's called Story of My Life. It's literally a workbook for preserving your legacy, your stories. You can do it one page at a time, one chapter at a time, one question at a time. And you can do this with other people as well. It's it's invaluable and it's something that I know that all of our descendants are going to thank us for, that we took the time to do this. And Sunny, I want to thank you for taking the time to kind of flip the tables on me a little bit and get me thinking and I'm more committed than ever so you did you did a good job but thank you so much for taking the time to help all of us capture our own stories thank you
Our Genealogy Gems Book Club featured author Sarah Chrisman lives like it's still the Victorian era. Her books and the Victorian lifestyle will be the subject of special interviews in next month's Genealogy Gems and Genealogy Gems Premium Podcasts. You heard right. Our featured author will be making a full-length appearance on this free podcast next month in celebration of the holiday season and our Victorian theme. And now, here is a reading that Sarah Christman sent us, taken from one of her blog posts. She describes what this time of year means in a house in the northern United States that doesn't use electricity. The light fades quickly at this time of year. Even when the sun is up, there is a dim, slanted quality to it which differs from the daylight of summer. Yet even this altered light is better than none, and I've learned to take advantage of its brief hours. Filling one oil lamp by the light of another is a devilishly tricky business, so I try to check all my lamps and my kerosene perfection heater at midday when the natural light is brightest. If other work pleads priority and I neglect this task, the lowering of the light in the sky reminds me of it by four, and I rush to complete it while I still may do it by daylight. By 5 p.m., after I've worked as long as possible by the last scraps of daylight fading in a west-facing window, the descending night will already make me light one of my lamps, and I usually choose one with a circular wick since they are so much brighter. Yesterday, the stormy weather brought on darkness so early that I already found myself wanting the lamp at half past four. I duly lit our Miller lamp and smiled at the cozy smell of the kerosene. There is something very comforting in that scent, like the essence of home. When electric lights first came into fashion, women called them cruel for the way they showed up all imperfections. They even said electric light made people look dead. The light of an oil lamp is warm and welcoming and very much alive. The hours of darkness are long in winter. The scant daylight is so devoted to tasks that will warm our weak human frames and let us see when the night comes. Sometimes it feels as though life at this time of year is devoted to the service of fire. Yet let no one call it burdensome, for tending the hearth and keeping the lamps of home burning is one of the most sacred of all ancient duties. The goddess Hestia is much in my thoughts at this time of year. Though entitled to her place at the table with the other gods of Olympus, she chose and was happiest with her seat by the hearth. Thank you so much, Sarah. You can learn more about Sarah's memoirs, The Victorian Life and Victorian Secrets in the show notes, along with her historical fiction series that's based on her knowledge of life in the late 1800s. And of course, if you decide to pick up copies of her books, whether ebooks or print, we always appreciate when you use the links in our show notes because that does help support the free podcast and the Genealogy Gems Book Club. Our sponsor for this episode is My Heritage, which has over 70 million members worldwide. If you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, My Heritage is the place that you want to be. Post your tree on My Heritage and start to see the magic as they automatically match it up with other trees, not just with genealogists in the country where you live, but around the world. Trees aren't primary sources, but they are excellent leads. I uploaded a portion of my family tree that contains my German heritage, and that's where I was really hoping to make a breakthrough, and very quickly it happened. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany. That was my first international cousin contact. But there's more at my heritage. Their unique and powerful search system, it's called Record Matches. It constantly calls over 5 billion historical records for your family. 
It's the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. Parents spend a good portion of their parenting time ferreting out the real story from their children. One time, when Henry was in kindergarten, he was playing outside with another little boy. I was in and out of the house watching him and checking on other things. Hours later, I noticed that his bike had been spray-painted black. When confronted, he claimed he had no idea how such a thing could have happened. Unfortunately, I jumped to conclusions and I blamed the other kid. Now, you have to give me credit. At six, Henry was such a good boy and had such an angelic face with blue, blue eyes and blonde, blonde hair. But as I was on the phone with my husband telling him about the issue, I looked over at Henry and I saw it, that guilty look, and my stomach sank, recalling the things I had said to the other boy's mom. I'll have to call you back, I told my husband. Hello, genealogy gems. This is Diane Southard, your DNA guide. As genealogists, we spend our time trying to ferret out the real story from our ancestors, or at least from the records they left behind, because they're not sitting in front of us with guilty looks on their faces. We are constantly checking family stories against, say, the information on a census record, and then comparing that to the family will, and then making sure it all agrees with what's in the military records. And even if we have total agreement, which isn't always, more information often comes along, like in the form of DNA testing, and we may find even more apparent discrepancies. I recently read an article in the Wall Street Journal about a reporter, Cameron McWhorter, who talks about finding just that kind of discrepancy between his family lore and his DNA. He even goes so far as to say, quote, I'm descended, at least partially, from liars, end quote. And he makes the point that, quote, many immigrants reinvented themselves when they arrived here in the United States, end quote, which could just be a nice way of saying that they've had a chance to invent a new legacy, not just reinvent it. His assessments are certainly interesting and worth reviewing to help us see how DNA testing can affect the way we look at family stories and traditional research results. McWhorter may be the classic modern genealogist, never having set foot inside a courthouse or scanned through microfiche, relying instead entirely, he reports, on internet research. Now, before you roll your eyes, stop for just a minute and appreciate how exciting this is. Here's a man who never gave his family history a second thought, yet because of the death of his parents, he started to tinker around a bit. And then, due to the large volume of information online, quote, was quickly pulled into the obsessive world of modern genealogical research, end quote. I say, score one for the genealogy world. What he found was that while his dad was proudly and solidly a self-proclaimed Scot, the records and DNA revealed his heritage was actually from Ireland and Eastern Europe. McWhorter says that, quote, his father hated Notre Dame, but judging by my results, he could have been one quarter to one half Irish. He spoke dismissively of people from Eastern Europe, but part of his genetic code likely came from that region, end quote. McWhorter's evaluation of his genetic report includes only his ethnicity results, which, as you can hear, were meaningful to him in the way they flew in the face of his father's prejudices and assertions of his own identity. But the ethnicity results fall short of the point of testing for most genealogists. He might be even more powerfully transformed if he took a look at his match list and saw an actual living cousin, for example, a third cousin perhaps, who was also descended from his German great-grandmother, who maybe never mentioned that she was also Jewish. Connecting with other cousins who also have paper trails to our ancestors serves to provide further confidence that we have all put the pieces together correctly and honored the right ancestor with a spot on our pedigree chart. It's like we multiply our own research efforts by finding more people like us, literally, who are descended from the same people and interested in finding them, as long as they're diligent in their research as we are, of course. At a recent conference, I met a fifth cousin. Even with connection that distant, it was exciting, and it made me want to look again at our connecting ancestors and pause for just a minute to marvel at how my DNA verified my paper trail back to them, and that part of them was around, in me, 
and in my new cousin. To me, that's the bigger picture I want to see. When the paper trail comes together with the DNA trail and turns into real-life cousins, even if they turn out to be a little different than the stories and sense of identity that were handed to us when we were young. Maybe you're something like Cameron McWhorter. You've taken a DNA test, been intrigued, or maybe even disappointed by the ethnicity results, but haven't fully explored all the matches on your list. I'm telling you, you may be seriously missing some opportunities. If that's you, I may actually have written my new DNA quick guide just for you. It's called Next Steps, Working with Your Autosomal DNA Matches. This guide will teach you how to leverage the power of known relatives who've tested. You'll get an introduction into chromosome browsers and their role in the search process and access to a free bonus template for evaluating the genealogical relationship of a match in relationship to the predicted genealogical relationship. This guide, it gives you a methodology for converting unknown relatives on your match list into known relatives, which is what we're really going for, right? So check it out in the show notes, either as a solo purchase or part of my advanced DNA bundle, which comes along with my new GED match guide and a guide expressly for organizing your DNA matches. You'll find a link to those in the show notes. Until then, happy trails finding your story among your DNA and your genealogy. I'm Diane Souther, your DNA guide. Profile America, Wednesday, November 9th. At 5.16 p.m. Eastern Time on this date 51 years ago, about 30 minutes after sundown, a fast-moving ripple of deeper darkness spread over much of the northeastern United States and a part of Canada. A misset relay in an Ontario power station began a cascade of power grid overloads and disconnects across 80,000 square miles of the U.S. and Canada. The entire states of New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts were blacked out. Some 30 million people, including New York City's roughly 7.8 million, were affected for up to 14 hours. Each year, more than 4 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity are generated by U.S. power companies. Over 10,500 establishments produce, transmit, and distribute this energy. You can find more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. I thought that was a fitting segment to choose after hearing Sarah Chrisman read about light in her gaslit home. They said 5.16 p.m. was 30 minutes after sundown in November in the northern United States, which kind of jibes with Sarah's comments that she's ready to light her lamps by 5 p.m. Whether we light with gas or electricity, whether we preserve our memories and share our interests on Facebook or in pasted up books, So many things are common to the human experience in every generation. The sunrise and sunset, the change of seasons, our our needs for warmth and shelter and food and water, and the threat of war or loss, and the hope of love and happiness. Yet I think about that conversation with Sunny and about my own life experiences and lessons and the ones I've learned from each ancestor. Each life is so unique Each life gives unique lessons because we often each learn something totally different from similar experiences. My ancestors' lives teach me something that I then wrap into my own life. Then I pass that combined bundle of experience and wisdom down to the next generation. It's one more layer. It's my layer of experience and wisdom and love added to the sum total of human history. I think I like that. It's time now to close, so I will thank the Genealogy Gems podcast production team for all of their hard work on this episode. Our content team is headed up by Sunny Morton and contributions from blogger Amy Tennant and your DNA guide, Diane Southard. Vienna Thomas is our awesome show's audio editor, and I'm your host and producer, Lisa Louise Cook. Explore more of what we do at my companion website, genealogygems.com. And you can find me on YouTube, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, and Twitter. Wherever you happen to be, we'll be there. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.